Good morning. Good morning. Everyone introduced themselves to each other. That was good. That was good. It was very unepiscopalian to be that warm. So that's good. So John, you yes, and I, you were late, so we didn't have time in the green room. I'm not sure I was late, <laughs> Dr. Cheney. Anyway, uh, we didn't have time to discuss what we're doing. So who's in charge? Uh, well, like General Haig, I'll be in charge. <laughs> uh, and I know Cheneys don't like grabbing power. So, um, so um, cool. So cool. <laughs> I know y'all don't like the unitary executive, so uh, I will, uh, I'll do it briefly. So um, Dr. Cheney is the, among many other accomplishments, uh, longtime service to the nation and to the cause of liberty in the world, uh, the cause of humanities as well, and uh, was chairman of the National Endowment, and uh, she and I have had offline conversations through the years lamenting uh, the lack of civics education and the need for, for greater narrative. But uh, I salute uh, Dr. Cheney for her lifetime of service to what matters most. And, um, and is also, on top of all of that, a Madison biographer. And I have enormous uh, sympathy and uh, regard for that because I'm trying to do the same thing. And as Lynn and I have talked about, James Madison did everything possible to make himself uninteresting. Uh, <laughs> now, if you wrote the Constitution and presided over the disillusion of the opposition party and created the United States Congress and was the architect really of, of divided sovereignty, you would suspect you would have a larger role in the national imagination. Uh, but part of the culture of that era was to repress, I don't know if this will sound somewhat foreign to you, there was a moment in American politics where repressing your personality was the order of the day. Uh, so this is if we're talking about Thermopylae, I realize that. Uh, but, but Lynn wrote a marvelous book about, about Madison and power, and we're gonna talk specifically about the War of 1812, but also, James Madison really does loom pretty large uh, in an era that is about as un-Madisonian as one could imagine, at least in terms of ethos. Well, it's an era that I like to cite when people say, oh my gosh, politics has never been this combative before. And I like to say, well, at least they aren't shooting each other. You know, calling one another out for duels. And this period around the War of 1812 was uh, especially heated. I think two of Dolly Madison's relatives uh, were in duels. One of them, who was a congressman, was uh, shot in the hip and uh, basically ended his career. Yeah. So, you know, it used to be pretty violent, too. Yeah. And also, so uh, let's put ourselves, let's, why don't you set the scene for us? Let's put ourselves back in. 1811, 1812, uh, a period of rising nationalism. Uh, we were f 35 years or so uh, from the revolution. We were only 22, 23 years from the founding of the Constitution. But if, uh, if we had been doing a, uh, a cable news conversation about the state of America in 1812, what would we say? Well, that it was very divided. Um, there are so many things that remind us of today. Um, there was great consternation about what Britain was doing. Uh, they were stopping our ships, seizing our ships, going on board our ships and taking off anyone they thought resembled a British person to uh, put in their navy because they were in a big uh, There was wasp war. profiling. <laughs> yes, kind yeah. of. Well, actually, it boiled down to they would ask you, or maybe they would show you a vegetable and if you called it uh, peas, you were okay. If you called it pays, you were gone. Um, so it, it, uh, that was an interesting era. The British were, uh, as I say, very hostile. And Americans, I think, would be fair to say, were going increasingly angry about that. Um, it was as though the British had forgotten that uh, we had won our revolution and they were treating us like a colony. And uh, it, except for the division, the Federalists on the other side, the, the Democratic Republicans um, really were mad about that, as were a lot of people from the South. Yep. Um, Henry Clay, they had all 
lost relatives uh, to Indians on the frontier. And uh, this made them even more uh, forward-leaning, I think. Of course, there had been plenty of uh, violence toward uh, the Indian population, too. And they didn't talk about that so much. But one, I think it was Felix Grundy, had several relatives um, killed in, in Indian raids. Yeah. The, uh, this is also really the beginning of Andrew Jackson, uh, whom I have to mention because I'm contractually required uh, as, a, <laughs> as a Tennessean to mention. Uh, and uh, you're exactly right. There was a sense that we had fought a war, but it had not yet been ratified. There was not a sense that this experiment was actually going to endure. And the British, our politics in the 1790s had been totally shaped by foreign policy, which is kind of hard to imagine. But uh, whether you favored the French or you favored the British, whether you favored uh, uh, protective navigation laws or tonnage laws, all of this shaped our domestic politics in the way really the Cold War politics did uh, mm -hmm. for a long time. And to some extent, the war on, the war on terror as well. Uh, so the Jacksonian rise, and though they would later uh, come to loggerheads, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, John C. Calhoun, they were these young nationalists. They were called the War Hawks. And basically they wanted to fight a ratifying war. They wanted to make clear that in fact the standalone American experiment was worthy of, of respect. And one of the things that I think is so important about history, and, and, and Lynn has made a lot of it, is when we look back from this perspective, of course it seemed as though it was going to turn out this way, right? I mean, naturally, right? But no one ever, since the first chapter of Genesis, sat around saying, you know what, everything's perfect, I hope nothing changes, right? It hasn't happened. And if you were the British Empire in 1810, why would you think you couldn't get this continent back? You'd lost this guerrilla war. You hadn't paid enough attention to it, really. Uh, it's this vast empire. European politics is ent was entirely shaped by winning or losing a war and then fighting the next one quickly to get it back. There's a reason northern France went back and forth forever. There was no reason in the British imagination to think that they couldn't recover the American continent. And that was one of the reasons they kept picking at us. Right. You, 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 sometimes you bully from a position of weakness, sometimes you bully from a position of, of strength, and that's really what, what the British were doing. And in the midst of this, as this comes to a head, you have this really remarkable character at, this, at the heart of it, James Madison, who did not fit what we would think of as the war president. If you were casting a movie about war presidents, James Madison would not be high on your list. Uh, but give us a sketch, if you would, uh, the, the Madison who became commander-in-chief. Well, I was thinking as, uh, as you spoke that perhaps he, Washington, would be a, a close uh, twin of this, worried about precedent and worried about following the Constitution. And this became a special issue when war was uh, on the table. And he was, he thought it was time for war, but he was so careful to make sure that the Congress declared war. Now, he wasn't hands off. He did things like release the Henry papers right. uh, to get everyone ginned up. But he was just so careful about following the Constitution and he knew it perhaps better than anyone since he'd been the driving force at the Philadelphia Convention. He was a small man. I say in my book, 5'6", I've begun to wonder more like 5'4". Yeah. I've always thought it was testimony to his character that he married Dolly, um, who was very, very beautiful, but, you know, three or four inches taller than he was. And uh, she liked to wear um, turbans with big plumes coming out. So... You know, she was probably a foot and a half taller than he no. uh, by the time she got dressed up. But they were a wonderful couple, uh, as ill-suited as they seemed when you saw them together. It was a real uh, 
a long-term love affair and companionship. Absolutely. The, um, so Madison's born in uh, Orange, Virginia. Uh, he's a, um, yeah, thank you. Is this me or is it? Okay. It's me. Ma'am, it's you. I think I keep bumping it. Okay, That's thank right. you. That's all right. We're going to do karaoke later. Well, all right, but now I can dominate. It's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I just spam. Uh, <laughs> I have found through the years that it's best with Mrs. Cheney just to say yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't go far into that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so, Madison is born in Virginia. Uh, I, and Lynn argue, argues, really I think as forcefully and as convincingly as anyone in the 200 and more years of historiography, that Madison suffered from epilepsy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about that. Uh, it's a very astute insight uh, in, in her more wonderful book. Uh, part of my argument is Madison grew up as Lynn was talking about, on the frontier, basically. So he had relatives who had been wounded in the French and Indian War. Uh, there were, in, I, I don't like the word incursion because ultimately we had incurred, incursed on them, uh, but there were a number of frontier struggles. Um, and in many ways, I think, too, you have to think of the American Revolution as a 50-year struggle uh, from the end of the French and Indian War until the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, and it was like the Cold War to some extent, it, in that it was sometimes hot, sometimes cold, but nobody in the midst of it knew how it was gonna turn out. And Madison was born at the front end of this, the end of that global struggle, the Seven Years' War, French and Indian War. Uh, there's speculation that his grandmother may have poisoned his grandfather. Oh no, 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 uh, it, was, know, it was a slave. Well, this is this. I'm glad we brought this up. But the slave was <laughs> the slave was convicted, but the slave had been uh, was then kept on the plantation for another 25 years by the grandmother. I just can't imagine Francis Madison doing that. But one never knows. That's uh, NCIS meets C-SPAN. <laughs> uh, it's going to be exciting. Uh, but he grew up in this mad in, in a kind of chaos, right? So so. Grandfather's keeling over poison, which happened a lot, by the way. There was a lot of poison. It did. Uh, happened in Dolly's family, too. Um, so they keeled over. Uh, you have the struggle at the frontier. I don't think it's any mistake that the man at the American founding who was most interested in order and in containing passion was someone who had grown up in a world of disorder where there were somewhat disorienting passions. His experience of life was we need to find a way to manage our worst impulses, and therefore gave us a constitution that has enabled us to do that. Uh, he is an unlikely uh, popular politician, but succeeds Jefferson in 1808, uh, wins again in, in 12, and becomes commander in chief at this inflection point. And he was very lucky, as it turned out, in his opposition. Yes. Uh, this was a time when I think you could say that the Federalists were traitorous. Yeah. Stephen Decatur, uh, one of the heroes of the War of 1812, reported um, seeing blue lights off the coast, and these were uh, uh, a way of warning the British that, uh, you know, American ships were patrolling. Um, Decatur seemed convinced. Right. Uh, so... Talk a little bit about the Warhawks, uh, Clay, Calhoun. Uh, this was a, a, a surge of nationalism, a surge of national pride uh, that shaped us ever since. I think that Henry Clay is one of the most fascinating characters. There's a book for you. <laughs> um, he was so charismatic. Um, he could win anyone over. Um, it was... Uh, a phenomenon that's some ways hard to understand because it wasn't a handsome man, but he was so charming. When he arrived in Washington the first time, he brought the president a bottle of Madeira, which was James's favorite drink, and he brought Dolly some snuff, which was one of her favorite uh, forms times. of recreation. Past times. 
But in any case, um, Clay resigned from the uh, Senate to uh, be part of the House of Representatives, and on the first day, he was elected speaker. Uh, he really, I think, uh, was the leader in uh, bringing the Congress uh, to declare war. An interesting sidelight on declaring war is that the Constitutional Convention, the Constitution said, um, Congress shall have uh, the power over war. And uh, James Madison leapt to his feet and said, no, 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 Congress shall have the power to declare war, and the executive will have the power to make war, which I think we've been glad for ever since. Um, can you imagine the Congress running a war? Mm. And uh, it just, just wouldn't work. No, no. But so for Henry Clay, he was a, he's a very compelling figure. And I'd like to know more about him. I think he had 12 children. Yeah, we did. He, um, great drinker, great card player. Um, I know the important stuff. Um, and his foreign policy was very important. Uh, <laughs> But he, he, he and Jackson were mortal enemies. And uh, mm -hmm. there was, oh God, the, the great uh, portraitist, um, Healy, uh, GPA G, Healy, I think was his name, um, who uh, painted all, this whole generation. He was traveling in the West, basically, uh, what was in the West, painting the prominent figures of the age when Jackson had retired to, to Nashville. And he had an appointment, he was going to paint uh, Jackson, and then was going to Ashland to Henry Clay's estate near Lexington, Kentucky, to paint uh, Clay. And he was about three weeks late to the Clay appointment. And when he walked in, Clay looked up and said, I see you, like all men, have found that man fascinating. <laughs> I was, they hated it, hated it. They were just absolutely awful. Um, Jackson what, was unbound. I mean, yeah. he, he paid little attention to... Uh, Orders. I guess it was Monroe that he uh, he really uh, had no respect for. So when Monroe, when one of Monroe's officers, Monroe was president at the time, uh, said to Jackson, "Don't do this," um, Jackson did it. <laughs> and uh, another time, when one of the officers um, gave an order on his own rather than going through presidential authority, uh, Jackson wouldn't do it. Now, that was probably well justified, but he would have been a hard man to uh, have running a war. He would have been. And, and, and interestingly, as president, never fought one. Hmm. Uh, had an excuse to go, obviously could have invaded South Carolina, as ever. He could always invade South Carolina. Uh, <laughs> that's redundant. Um, and France, <laughs> which you same there, right? Um, but he... Uh, to me, what's so fascinating about Jackson in, in this era is he was the first president of his kind. He was from the lowest rung of white society. Uh, didn't know his father. We have very much, there's a, actually an interesting subtopic here. Uh, there's an extraordinary number of American presidents who did not know who their, their, their father was or just had no contact with them. It's sort of interesting. Gerald Ford. His, his President oh. Ford's name was not Ford. He was, who knows that? You got it? Let's see. Do you know the name? Leslie, Leslie Lynch King Jr. Huh. You win the Dork Award. <laughs> <laughs> and with all respect, there's a lot of competition. <laughs> uh, Bill Clinton, his name was not Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, interestingly, so you either have Barack Obama spent one day with his father, with one visit uh, in Hawaii as a child. So any, th there's an interesting something about becoming the father of the country when you don't have a father. That's that's fascinating. Well, uh, but he was becoming Jackson was becoming um, a cooler political operative as he came through those years, and ultimately, of course, in 1824 had occasion to disrupt the constitutional structure. Uh, he had won the popular vote, uh, had, not yet, had not gotten the sufficient number in the Electoral College, so it goes to the House of Representatives. Henry Clay, uh, in those days, becoming Secretary of State was the way to become president. Uh, Though Vice President was another way. Only, <laughs> it's true, and I don't want to question you on any matters vice presidential. Uh, <laughs> I hoped you'd realize that. 
always, ma'am. Uh, see, it's just best. Just, just nod. Um, um, no, Madison uh, was Secretary of State, um, but well, was, Madison Monroe. Not to everyone had been Secretary of State except uh, John Adams and Washington. Uh, yes, of course. Um, but uh, they made way for each other. You know, they, they appointed old vice presidents or got old vice presidents um, appointed as the years went on because they wanted the next president to be from Virginia. Right. So I think, was it Madison? Had two vice presidents die. They were so old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it was just a way to keep the Virginia dynasty going. But, but let's get back to the War of 1812. What is your most interesting part of it, or what's the part you admire most about it? What I admire most about it is I think America required a ratifying struggle. Mm. And I think Madison has been, beginning with Henry Adams, and even unto this hour, has been attacked for fighting a war that at the end of the war there was not much to show for it in terms of the, the policy aims. But there was an open question about whether the United States would survive from foreign interference before 1815, and there was no question after it. And I think you have to judge these things, I think you'll appreciate this, you have to judge these things on their long-term effects. We blame people when things out of their control go wrong. I think we should give credit to people when they take the risk of judgment and it works out. That's... Uh an admirable historic explanation as a, as a reader. There's usually know? a but after that. Well, <laughs> when I think of the War of 1812, I think of heroism. The uh, uh, naval battles in uh, 1812 really kept the country's spirits going when uh, the land battles were uh, atrocious. I have wondered sometimes what is the lesson we've learned from the War of 1812. And one is, don't invade Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we learned that in the Revolution, too. But the heroism of people like Stephen Decatur, mm -hmm. uh, Isaac Hall. Mm -hmm. um, Decatur was interesting. Yeah. He fought a battle. Uh, was he at Lake Erie? Um, I get the battles mixed up. But Decatur uh, got control of Lake Erie, which made things infinitely better for the United States because it was a British supply route. Um, then, of course, there was the Constitution versus the Guerrier, the uh, first important, um, most publicized battle that, uh, that we won. But Decatur, I have to go back for a second. He was an incredibly handsome guy, married a lovely woman. When he was 27, he carried off uh, the heroic deeds of the uh, War of 1812. Earlier, he'd been a hero at, uh, in the Tripolitan Wars, the Wars of Tripoli. And he was, at 41, he was killed in a duel. And it's just, when I think of dueling, I just mm -hmm. can't imagine. But remember, it used to be worse. They killed each other. Yeah. I was a, a, a Jefferson biographer. And so if any of you have rap lyrics about Thomas Jefferson, I'll be outside <laughs> later. Uh, or Madison, Madison. Uh, Madison, yeah. <laughs> how, how he will make something rhyme with New Orleans, I don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> or divide Montesquieu. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was um, out talking about Jefferson, I got a call, this was seven, eight years ago, a call from Chris Christie. And this is before he became Patty Hearst. And, um, uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, and he said, I want to talk to you about Jefferson. Said, okay, so we, I went to have lunch. And Chris Christie's great company, as you know, just great stories. And so we're sitting, and um, he says, you know, I'm really more of a Hamilton guy. And without thinking about it, I just said, well, that's great, Governor, but at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. And then, <laughs> damnedest thing happened, I couldn't get back into the city. All the, all the bridges were closed. Um, so, speaking of dueling, um, uh, talk about the inv a city you have lived in, uh, off and on for a long time. Uh, talk about the burning of Washington and Mrs. Madison. Well, first of all, the burning of Washington. Can you imagine a president surviving politically uh, when that happened? But of course, in this climate, yes, ma'am. 
Okay. Well, I can imagine anything at this point. <laughs> I don't think we should discuss current politics. But in, in any case, um, it was not a big city, you know. When we think of the burning of Washington, we think of today's Washington and things going up in flames. But it was really a small village. Um, we didn't lose a whole lot. I mean, we did lose the Capitol. We did lose the White House. But uh, Besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah. <laughs> Well, and most citizens weren't affected. However, they did want to uh, concede. They did want to uh, give up right then. But Dolly is so interesting. She is perhaps the only woman I can think of from that period who truly felt uh, about herself that she was a public figure and that, by gosh, she wanted people to recognize this. She wasn't going to retreat. All the other women, I'm sure there are exceptions, burnt letters you know, especially the letters to their husbands and, mm -hmm. and relatives. Not Dolly. She saved everything, including one letter that's three pages long and covers three days, I believe. And it's the days when, you know, she's looking out the window through a spyglass and uh, looking for James, and he doesn't come. And she's ordering one of the servants at the house to tear off the frame of the Washington painting. She tells all of these stories. And Catherine Algor, who's an amazing mm -hmm. um, biographer, wrote about Dolly that this three-page letter wasn't a letter. You know, it was more like a diary that she was going to hand down to posterity. So, gosh, she is really one of the most interesting characters, and I think certainly the most interesting woman of the uh, early republic. Maybe Mercy Warren, who had the trepidity to be of historian. She wrote yeah. about the Revolutionary War. But anyway, when I was writing my Madison book, and I loved every part of it, I kept saying to myself, how many pages before I can write about Dolly? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Because she is so interesting. Uh, Madison has given a problem to all of his biographers, which is he waited for Dolly until he was in his mid-40s, and so do we. Uh, <laughs> and believe me, things get a lot more interesting. Uh, I love her wardrobes. Uh, yeah. You know, you find these dis uh, discussed in uh, contemporary writing. The one I think is my favorite is pink satin, a long gown, with a lot of ermine trim. And uh, she always wore turbans with peacock feathers, but this particular turban was white and had a lot of gold chains on it. And she had a matching gold chain around her waist. But she was not uh, a wallflower. She was not no. a shy person. She was out there. And like all good Quaker girls, that's what she wore. Yes, exactly. um, <laughs> and she had no trouble with slavery. Um, when Madison died, like many other founders, he was... Uh, in debt, really poor. They had to sell Montpelier. Madison's friends say that uh, he told them he was going to free his slaves upon his death, and then Dolly didn't do it. Right. I don't know if that's true or not. You know, blame the woman is um, part of what's going on here. I'm not familiar with that. Um, <laughs> the other, if, if you're interested in Dolly Madison, uh, the much better part of Jeff Cowan's family is Holly Shulman, who is the editor of the yes. Dolly Madison Papers in Virginia, who in a novelistic twist is married to the editor of the James Madison Papers. I know this sounds like a joke and there's one parachute, <laughs> but they really do. This is, uh, and there's, there's a lot there. Um, talk a little bit about that, though. You, you have been a, uh, a woman of power and stature and authority in Washington over a long period of time. Uh, is it, when you look at Dolly and how she helped create the social structure in which the Republican lowercase r world took place, do you credit her with helping create a role in an era when women had very few, if any, legal rights? Well, she certainly did do that. And uh, she helped um, James uh, win re-election by having a lot of congressmen. Congress was intimately involved in electing the president at that time. Um, the caucus, they nominated the president. And he was uh, running for the Republican nomination against George Clinton. Mm 
And Dolly just invited congressmen to her house. And she didn't care if some were Federalist and some were Republican. Jefferson couldn't stand that. He didn't want anybody disagreeing at his dinner table. Jefferson um, had women over when he needed a hostess because there were a few other women. But Dolly invited men and women sort of indiscriminately, you know, come to my house for dinner. So she helped him in that way. She was also traduced. I mean, people said the most awful things you can imagine about Dolly. Um, she was not what they said she was, but again, she was out there. Um, she is pictured in the White House among the First Ladies with the lowest cut gown and the least underpinnings you can imagine. I mean, it is quite, it, it scandalized people. They would say, why doesn't she have a kerchief? Meaning, cover up, Dolly. Um, and of course, the snuff uh, scandalized people too. I think she did make a difference. I think there are other first ladies who have, but I'm not sure most have. You know, they've tried, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt made a difference, but I'm not sure she made a difference in Franklin's political life. She, um, what do you think? We should have Doris here. That Mrs. Roosevelt? Uh, well, she was, she was the persistent uh, voice of conscience, um, reminding him of what the liberal part of his party wanted. I mean, imagine being Franklin Roosevelt and dealing with a Democratic Party that ranged from his wife to Southern segregationists. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an immensely complicated task. And I think that of the, of the first ladies uh, who've had a significant role, I think Mrs. Roosevelt is obviously probably first among equals, uh, Mrs. Madison. Um, my sense is Mrs. Lincoln just complicated things. Um, George W. Bush will say that you know, he was reading about Mary Todd Lincoln and he, he couldn't imagine what it would be like to be the commander in chief and, ha and, not and not look forward to going home. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a really interesting. Insight. You're you're talking about political influence, and I think that usually takes place, you know, behind closed doors. Um, it wouldn't be right for, uh, you know, Mrs. Bush either one to get out in public and talk about things that uh, mattered to her. The social thing is what I'm thinking about because there are great social expectations on Washington wives which used to drive me crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I don't mind socializing, but to do it because it's expected politically never struck me as a, as a good thing to do. So I like to point out that it works sometimes. It doesn't work often. I think the political, intellectual part works uh, more often. Uh, may I ask a question that may seem slightly off point, but it's not. The, um, the War of 1812 and Pearl Harbor were the two significant moments in American life in which the homeland of the United States was invaded or attacked. And you had a uh, particular and, dare I say, privileged view of the third time that happened. Uh, on September 11th, and I've heard you talk about this before. I think people would be fascinated by, could you tell us what September 11th was like for you? I think like most Americans, uh, I was downtown. I uh, heard first about the first plane into the tower, and you think, ooh, that's a weird accident. But as soon as you hear about the second one, you know something is going on. And the Secret Service uh, picked me up right away, and for reasons I don't understand till this day, they took me to the White House. Um, but it was wonderful in the sense that I got to see this horrible event as it unfolded um, from the inside. Um, as I say, I don't know why, but I'm so grateful. Um, I was down in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, the PIOC, it's, uh, it's called, it's sort of, it was old fashioned then, I suspect they've doodled it up since, but uh, one of the funny things is you walk into the PIOC and there were doilies on the table, table with cookies. And you know, somebody was just trying to make it nice, but it was so incongruous. 
um, we had trouble getting television reception and ended up mostly watching CNN. People upstairs were getting better reception. It was just a chilling day. Um, I tried to keep notes, which were subsequently subpoenaed, which was fine with me because you couldn't even read them. You know, I was so shaken by the event. I'm sure you would have done a much better job no, of, of keeping track. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I remember most is uh, taking off in a helicopter from the South Lawn, and that never is done except for the president. But I guess for some reason it was the safest way to get us out of there. And as the helicopter uh, flew up, you could see flames rising from the Pentagon. And I... I did have to think about the War of 1812. You know, that was a little village. This was a, the important heart of the United States, but still, it was quite eerie. We then went to undisclosed locations for the longest time. It was usually Camp David. <laughs> <laughs> now it can be disclosed. Well, thank you. Um, uh, so legacies, uh, lessons, as we... Uh, enter another era in which it seems unlikely that there would be the kind of global war that we saw twice in the 20th century. Is there uh, something we can profitably learn from 1812 to guide us as we think about the projection of force going forward? Well, I'm not sure this is projection of force, but uh, one of the things that James Madison did was not regard the Federalists as traitors. You know, he, this was the opposing party, and uh, you know, they were um, in contact with the British. Um, they were all in New England. But he, he, he regarded them as wrong, but not traitors. And I think that was part of his legacy at the end of the war. People um, praised him for that. Um, well, don't invade Canada, that's one of my... Don't invade Canada. Yeah. Jefferson said it would just be a short walk into Canada. And of course, we uh, got pushed back. I think that the Battle of Queenstown, mm -hmm. Queenston, I don't know how you say it, was the most bloody battle of the war. We lost several thousand, uh, several thousand Americans. I guess the other one is just don't be surprised. And I think you said that at the beginning. Things never turn out quite as though you expect they would. Never believe in first reports. Hmm. Um, you know, wait until the situation solidifies. Madison got caught up in that when a young man named Erskine, who was British, came to him and said, hey, the British are saying they're going to uh, solve all your problems, and so everything is going to be fine. And Madison uh, did all that a president would do to make that happen, and it turned out that Erskine was, what do you say, over his skis. Yeah. He was married to an American um, and loved the United States. And he kind of wanted it to be over, and so exaggerated his orders. So, you know, then Madison had to do, undo everything. In those days, I suppose it was harder to wait because you were always waiting. You know, it took, what, three months to get across the Atlantic? Two weeks, in any case. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It depended on whether you had fair winds. The winds, yeah. Um, I, I have often wondered how, and this gets back to the Madison papers, how did people like Henry Adams or... Theodore Roosevelt wrote about the War of 1812. They didn't have the internet. And, no, it's true. Really? Well, yes, John. <laughs> you, you just praised the people at the Madison Papers. I think Monroe would be a more important figure if his papers were online. But if you think of Dumas Malone, he wrote six volumes about uh, Jefferson. If you think of him, sitting at the university, mm -hmm. having to get the books for everything, you know, having to have the papers for everything, having to synthesize it all, and then write it, it's just like a miracle. And I'm so grateful that uh, yeah. historians who had it hard um, did it so you and I would have it easier. I think about this all the time in terms of the Bible. Huh. Think about those monks all those years before movable type, <laughs> sitting there, copying this over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the fact that literature survives from the pre-Gutenberg era is nothing short of miraculous. Um, and I guess the 
course, Vice President Cheney defeated Al Gore, who invented the internet. <laughs> and so, I don't know where that puts that situation. Um, are you working on another book? Thinking big thoughts? I'm working on a book about the Virginia dynasty. I mentioned how the Virginia presidents, four of the first five were from Virginia. Uh, how they prepared the way for one another. I mean, it was no accident that four of the first five presidents were from Virginia. And I have found Monroe really interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll say this is part of my dorkiness um, because I found Madison interesting, but Monroe, whom you've heard a little about, fascinating. Not very smart, but fascinating. <laughs> that has never been a barrier to office in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> well. Some people say he was the first ordinary American to be a president, and there's something oh, that's to that. Yeah. That's interesting. But he, was, but he was a genuinely, he loved politics, though, as I remember. Is that right? And, and yes, and he had an amazing track record. He spent more time uh, in France and Europe uh, than any other of our early presidents. And uh, he was twice recalled. Right. Now, that means you've done something really bad. It's not like today when you don't have to have done anything really bad. But you've done something really bad, and so we want you back here. We need here. to call witnesses to find out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but the point was he survived it. Now, it's sort of like saying, how did Madison survive the burning of Washington? How did Monroe manage to survive being recall recalled twice, running for president once and failing, running for Congress once and failing? He just, he had this resilience yeah. that uh, was quite amazing. No, so that's, that's what I'm working on. Good. That's excellent. We look forward and to what that. Are, what are you working on, John? Well, I'm doing the Madisons. Uh, so I'm in the midst of, let's see, it is, in my head, it is 1794. You've got a long uh, way to go. Oh, God, I know. He lived forever. Um, <laughs> Like all great it's hypochondriacs, true. James Madison lived forever. Um, <laughs> he was always convinced he was dying, and then he'd live to be in his 80s. Um, what I'm trying to do is do a joint portrait of, of the two of them as, and really, it, this, all, this tends to happen. Um, you start something, and then it, it seems to become more relevant, which is better than the alternative. Um, <laughs> but the idea that Madison was so devoted to balance. He genuinely believed that if we did not divide sovereignty, if we did not check our passions, that the experiment wouldn't work. And I think a lot of his, you know, he's sometimes accused of changing his mind for venal political purposes. I think there's a pretty, there's a pretty consistent theme, which is that if things got out of balance, he wanted to put them back in balance. The and one thing he never wavered on was freedom of speech. Right. And uh, at this period, it couldn't have been more important. The Federalists were being traitorous. Uh, everyone said, put them in jail, hang them if you need right. to. And he didn't do that. He was even more remarkable than Jefferson at yeah. not doing that. And, and religious liberty uh, mm -hmm. as well, which is a, a corollary. Um, so it's fascinating. And uh, I mean, I wrote about Andrew Jackson and the most interesting note I got about the Jackson book was from George W. Bush, uh, and he wrote, and it was hand done, so uh, he said, as you might imagine, I'm interested in presidents who seize the initiative, hmm. which was an interest, so that was written at a period where uh, the executive power was being examined, and right now, contemplating Madison and the debates over how do we divide sovereignty, in this climate, uh, wherever you stand, is, is relevant. So it beats working for a living. And what a great audience. And John and I have to leave before they drag us off. So, so we're going to go burn Washington. <laughs> <laughs>